Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, here to the Forum of Hydrogen and Fuel Cells Europe. Uh, here to our panel discussion about heavy duty trucks. Is hydrogen the future? That is the question, and that is the panel discussion. And you can also talk with us. Uh, whenever you have a question, just raise your hand. Uh, I'll be with the microphone right with you. And here are my guests on stage. Right next to me, Jens Fleckenstein, Clean Energy Partnership uh, and also Global Hydrogen Strategy at Daimler Truck. So you're at a double position mm -hmm. here, we can say, Mr. Fleckenstein. I would like to welcome very much uh, Audrey Ma. She's Vice President, International Markets of Refire Group. Good to have you here. Mm -hmm. I would like to uh, say hello to Yves Dumoulin, uh, Senior Vice President, Foresia Hydrogen Solutions of Forvia Group. And uh, opposite of me is Björn Noack, Director Sustainable Mobility Strategy at Robert Bosch Powertrain Solutions. I'm very happy that you're all here. Please, audience, give them a big hand. <laughs> and of course, you can always interfere. Just raise your hand if you have a question. Mr. Fleckenstein, I, I start with you. Drymer Truck is uh, part of the Clean Energy Partnership, as I mentioned already, which is an industry partnership to establish green mobility with hydrogen and fuel cells. It was founded in 2002 by technology, petroleum and energy companies, gas producers, car manufacturers and suppliers. What have you achieved in the first 21 years? <laughs> yes, um, as you said, the Clean Energy Partnership um, is an organization out of industry partners um, with, uh, with a major focus on standardization and codes and standards and to enable um, refilling protocols. And in the last years, we were mainly focusing on the refilling protocols for passenger cars. The 700 bar refilling technology is one of the achievements. And now we are more and more looking into, into the hydrogen refilling of heavy duty trucks um, where we need to uh, work on 700 bar technology, but also on the liquid hydrogen technology. It, it's really hard work defining the standards and, and finding uh, solutions together. This is the yeah, conditio sine qua non to, to build up a hydrogen mobility, isn't it? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And it's very crucial that when we have, with our Daimler truck perspective, the products ready, that we have an infrastructure which is fitting to the uh, products which we want to bring on the market. And only due to that, we can achieve that uh, European rollout and also global rollout is possible. And that's why standardization um, with a uh, yeah, global perspective is very, very crucial for us. To bring out your products, and now I, I announce you as, as uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, as uh, Global Hydrogen Strategy Manager at uh, Daimler Trucks. So y what are your products? I, I know you have a dual strategy, dual track strategy. You go uh, either on batteries and fuel cells. What technology for what application? Yes, we have a dual strategy, battery electric on the one hand and hydrogen based strategy on the other hand. And um, in our perspective, whenever it's coming to higher ranges, um, more flexibility, which is, is especially the case for heavy-duty long-haul applications, then we see clear advantages for hydrogen-based um, uh, technology. And, uh, and that's very, very crucial uh, to have it um, for European market, but also a global rollout then ready. So you believe that you will have both, both markets? Absolutely. And would you say one will have a bigger share or the other, or in the long run it will be that one or the other one? I think it's driven by the segment, by the customer expectation, but also what infrastructure is available. So I think we will see regions where, for example, um, charging stations are more in focus, and we also see regions where hydrogen will be more in focus. And all these factors together um, will, will drive the, the solution. But in the end, the customer needs to decide, and we are offering the customer all, um, all options. Ms. Ma, um, Hello. Refire Group has already deployed over 3,000 fuel cell vehicles and has just unveiled its latest, latest heavy-duty fuel cell system, Prisma 22. I, I hope it was 22. It's a, it's a Latin uh, letters. Yes, <laughs> Prisma you're right. 22. There's a Prisma 22 here. And you said it gets customers a big step closer to cost parity with diesel vehicles. You say that only for China or, for, or is it worldwide? The cost parity. Well, cost parity is certainly a target that we're achieving collectively as a fuel cell industry. And the case in China is um, that by this year, they are uh, over 
13,000 registered fuel cell commercial vehicles already on the road and insured. So I think China is taking a big leap forward in taking this technology to commercialization. And in terms of parity, we still have some distance to go, uh, but it is uh, the direction that we're all striving for. Okay. And, but, but you're also heading for the international market, don't you? And, and will we get cost parity there also soon? Um, well, international market has been uh, one of the focus of our market approach since 2017. Uh, we've made our international, um, the first foray into this international sales in 2019. And certainly we are uh, setting up local teams to serve our local markets from um, the understandings of Europe as well as North America. Um, but cost parity, this is not something that we can do alone as a company coming from uh, a fuel cell uh, integrators or fuel cell product standpoint. We are actively building ecosystems and working with large oil and gas companies as well as downstream uh, OEM partners and uh, off takers to see how can we close the loop together. And in this case, government incentives and programs is certainly key as well to get the first level of parity here with assistance. And going forward, I think in very soon time, we're not talking about decades now, we're talking about in years, I believe there is a, a likelihood that we can achieve um, reasonable parity with considerations of, you know, uh, cost uh, of ESG programs being considered, uh, as well as with some of the climate aids um, funding considered. Um, third step, uh, maybe perhaps in five to ten years time frame, uh, I believe there's a solution to get there. So Noah, it's only one year ago that uh, you said the internal combustion engine is still a long way from being phased out. That was in Switzerland at a at a mechanics uh, uh, auto mechanics uh, event in Switzerland. Do you still stand behind that statement? Oh, absolutely. So, I think we have to look at it from a global perspective. That's also, I think, why this panel being in English is quite helpful because it's a German exhibition, a trade fair here, and the Germans sometimes tend to get out of focus the requirements in the world. So it's more, it's more diverse than That's from the Alps we, to the That's why you were all invited here, so you represent the world. <laughs> Ex exactly. And if you look at the world, we, we still see that the leading markets for us as automotive industry, they have made the decisions, they go towards electric powertrains. But that doesn't mean that all markets in the world will move to electric powertrains. We still have a huge market left over for combustion engines with growing need of mobility demands, especially in, in goods transportation. So there we do still see the need of combustion engine. And let me put probably one or two points more to this. So a few weeks ago, we saw Mr. Timmermans from the European Commission um, publishing the proposal for the heavy duty CO2 fleet regulation that is under revision right now. And he explicitly mentioned as well the combustion engine powered by green hydrogen or clean hydrogen to fulfill CO2 targets. So for heavy duty transport, I think it's in. Even for passenger cars, the new um, agreement between Commission and some member states of the European Union, it clearly mentioned that RFNBOs, renewable fuels of non-biological origin, means green hydrogen, for example, are still a permissible option also for passenger car and light duty in Europe. So mm -hmm. that's why I still see, even though from a development perspective, strategy perspective, we need to qualify our technologies for electrification, that's no doubt, but still we have to make good offerings for combustion engines. Mm -hmm. Mr. Noak, uh, and, and let's talk about your fuel cells you're producing. You're, um, you deliver your fuel cells at the moment to Nikolaus, fuel cell trucks, uh, um, and uh, also uh, a talented engineer, Christian Appel, who's also working on it to, to make it run uh, at, fuel, uh, at Nikola. Uh, these trucks will be delivered in the United States this year, in Europe next year. So. Uh, do you think we will see the same success story that we uh, saw with uh, cars and Tesla, Nikola and trucks? Sounds well, similar, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I, we would be more than glad if we have, with the first big OEM already, then this big hit. But that we need to see, and it would more depend on the entire ecosystem, whether there would be hydrogen available, fuel station was mentioned already by the colleague, and, and then the performance of Nikola. So that's nothing that I could judge at the end of the day, we would be really happy because we are indeed prepared for mass production of the fuel cell power modules. 
for, for any truck builder. You go into mass production now this year, don't you? We will go in summer, in July, mid of July, we will start our series production at Bosch for the fuel cell power module. So right. not only Nikola can order this, but any, any OEM. Sure. <laughs> That's what you're heading for, indeed. Monsieur Dubelon, um, Forestia is, like Bosch, uh, one of the world's big automotive suppliers. Uh, you have a great expertise in hydrogen storage system, architecture, and systems integration. What solutions do you offer for heavy-duty fuel cell trucks? So we, we offer a comprehensive range of uh, storage solutions, uh, starting with uh, uh, Type 4 tanks um, uh, with uh, composite liners. and. Uh, 350 bars, increasing in pressure up to 700 bars, and extending to uh, Type 4 and Type 3 uh, systems as well. And we, we had in the pre-talk, you, you said, well, your, your title is wrong, you know, because you, you were asking heavy-duty trucks, is hydrogen the future? No, it's not. It's present, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And um, it seems that uh, my, uh, my colleagues here are, are sharing this view. Uh, hydrogen is... Uh, certainly the future. I think our companies here uh, all share this uh, conviction, but is more importantly today is our present. I was uh, giving you the example before that um, we are going to deliver about 13,000 tanks in China this year. Uh, we started our mass production facility in Europe uh, in, uh, in January, uh, so three months ago, and we're going to reach uh, 7,500 um, uh, tanks delivered uh, per year at the end of this year. Where are all these vehicles? I can't see them on the street. <laughs> <laughs> so remember that we are a supplier, right? So, so we are delivering this to uh, okay. my esteemed <laughs> colleagues sitting beside me. <laughs> <laughs> They're testing it only. <laughs> what, what do you do with some luggage time? <laughs> I'm missing them, you know. Uh, there are already 7,500 <laughs> in France, and, but where are they on the streets? What would you say, Mr. <laughs> From Daimler's side, we have um, at least uh, two vehicles currently in the testing on liquid and on gaseous hydrogen. There are more uh, buses uh, available uh, currently, also running um, out of uh, earlier production series. Um, oh, but the challenge which is now coming is to match the ramp up of vehicle series production and the uh, ramp up um, of, of hydrogen supply and refilling station. And only when we may, uh, are able to match both in a similar speed, then uh, we, we can really make this to a successful story. Synchronization of, of ramp up, that's, that's the point. Monsieur Dumoulin, but you have one problem if, if you are into the storage system architecture and systems integration because you don't know really what kind of hydrogen will be in the heavy duty fuel cell trucks. So uh, will it be 350 bar, 700 bar, or even liquefied hydrogen? Or do you have a crystal uh, ball and, and know the future? So we. We believe uh, that same as uh, battery and hydrogen will coexist, uh, different levels of pressure will coexist. <coughs> and that's why we, we have developed this comprehensive portfolio that is suitable for different types of pressure uh, and, uh, and different types of vehicle. You mentioned as well uh, liquid hydrogen. So this is an important uh, topic for us. One of the barriers uh, to um, uh, hydrogen deployment that we are trying to overcome at the very moment is the cost of hydrogen itself. And it could be that liquid hydrogen offer uh, an even um, better competitiveness uh, than uh, gas with hydrogen for some application. And, and that's why we are as well uh, working for the long term, not just uh, to the, the present deployment of gas with hydrogen, but as well on an uh, onboard storage solution for liquid hydrogen. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Fleckenstein, I was talking to some of your colleagues, like uh, Dr. Manfred Schuckert, for instance, at IAA last year, and they, your colleagues are all convinced that in the long run, it will be liquid hydrogen for heavy-duty trucks. Um, so will we see an, uh, another infrastructure then for liquid hydrogen? Do you believe that? I think it will be the same infrastructure. So liquid hydrogen has a charming um, that I can produce the hydrogen where there is cheap energy, and I can liquefy it where there is cheap energy. And then I leave it on the level, bring it to the uh, European countries or the country where the offtake is, and then I can refill it without changing it. And then I have an advantage in ranges 
um, and in usability, uh, refilling speed, for example, and, um, and that will be an advantage for the customer. And this is only achievable with liquid hydrogen. To have the full supply chain until the refilling station, um, which is a very beneficial um, supply chain route. And then I couldn't choose if I can compress it or if I leave it liquid. And of course, leaving it liquid will enable further advantages. You to will the liquefy it at the refilling station then. I oh. will. I will get oh. it liquefied oh, at the refilling station. Get it there station. and then, then uh, make okay. Make and it for example, for, um, for distribution uh, to the refilling station, um, the compressed uh, liquid has more advantages than a gaseous um, distribution because I can get more hydrogen into the tank and bring it to the refilling station. So you don't believe in uh, in hydrogen pipelines, right? Uh, going to the filling station? I think the hydrogen pipeline has a big disadvantage. I can build refilling station where there is a pipeline, but whenever I need to build pipelines to the refilling station, then I have a huge infrastructure impact. And for getting a, a dense uh, refilling um, network across Europe, um, then the distribution in the, to the refilling station is a crucial point. I would like to give you the opportunity to ask your questions, if you have any question. Just raise your hand, I'll give you the microphone right with you. Um, Ms. Ma, um, you're delivering your uh, fuel cells mainly to the Chinese market, to, to Geely or Sunny, for instance. Um, one of your first German customers was a converter of diesel trucks, uh, clean logistics, uh, which unfortunately recently became uh, insolvent. I was wondering, why don't you buy clean logistics? <laughs> they still have an order of 5,000 fuel cell trucks from GP Jewel. So that's, it's business there. Right. And, you know, we, we have certainly been working with clean logistics for some years, since 2019, to be exact. And it's been very much on the public news here what had happened to them. Um, We're all very sorry to hear that. Yes. Indeed. But I think it was a great endeavor that they have pushed it so far. Um, Let's just say we're, we still remain on very, very friendly terms, and we're looking forward to uh, collaboration opportunities in the future. And as you have just said, we do have supplies to German market. Uh, so while China is our big market because of the share volume of uh, vehicles deploying there, as of today, we have more than 4,500 vehicles with refire systems inside in China. So it is a very important market for us going forward, um, but we are certainly looking for um, more opportunities to collaborate with um, clean logistics uh, like uh, retrofitters here to get this market up and going, and as well as for um, other programs, probably more, more in the long term. So retrofitting is not your business, certainly. Right. Yeah. Mm, we are a tier one, so we, sure. we make fuel cell systems, and we're not an OEM. Yeah. Uh, we could support the uh, retrofitters and the OEMs uh, in doing their uh, prototypes. That's one of our business in application engineering, but we're not vehicle manufacturer. Yeah. It, it's funny, in, in the automotive industry, it's, it's very strict, you know, you either are OEM or you're tier one or tier two, and, and you don't, don't really, well, Bosch may maybe mix it a little bit, Scheffler did it as, as well. Uh, um, Mr. Nowak, uh, are you also thinking about becoming an OEM? <laughs> me, me, in person, me in person, not, and not Bosch, in I think person, I can no, also confirm your, your that. Your company, of course. <laughs> I, I do think that although Bosch wouldn't become an OEM there, but what you mentioned was probably true in the old stabilized ecosystem of combustion engine driven cars. That was a very stable value chain and it had good reasons to be like this. And now we need to build up a new ecosystem. If you want to bring hydrogen into mobility applications, we need to move. Everyone needs to move. I think that is why we have now this interesting panel here as well. So we have Daimler trucks, we have cell centric on powertrain level. Then we have Bosch also now on powertrain level with a fuel cell power module, but still we are also on component level. We are also offering stacks, electric air compressor and all these components mm. because right now we, I think we even don't know whether we are competitors or not in, in five years down the line, right? So the market needs to build up first and then we see who can do what best and then probably 10 years, 15 years down the line, we have the same solid structures again. But right now, everyone that wants to make it a success needs to be flexible also in terms of business model that he's following. 
in the automotive industry is at the moment like a shark person, I, I would say. Uh, so, so the OEMs are taking most of the wealth coming from the automobiles and leave very little to the suppliers, at least if it comes to uh, battery electric vehicles. Isn't that true? Wouldn't you say, agree? I, I think that would be, especially now with the dynamics from the last few quarters, I think we, we need to see how this will be balanced in the long run. But I'm, I'm also quite sure that there will be a new balance for this and a successful balance because otherwise the vehicles wouldn't have performed like this over many, many decades. So if there is no common good communication between the different value chain positions, we wouldn't be there where we are right now. Uh, but Mr. Mr. Dumoulin, uh, hydrogen and fuel cell technology is also a big chance for suppliers, isn't it? Because, you know, in there, there it's, it's a bit complicated than, than only BEF vehicles, uh, more, more components, uh, well, more, more market share as well. Well, um, yes, it's an opportunity for suppliers, but I think it goes beyond that. I think it's an opportunity for all of us, right? Um, hydrogen is an opportunity to make mobility greener, cleaner. And I think that's what drives us every day. And, and that's you know, why we are uh, so much um, engaged into this area. Um, besides making um, mobility greener, there is also another opportunity, uh, which is to make, let's say, uh, mobility more independent from geopolitical risks. We've seen, unfortunately, with the, the recent event um, in, uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, you know, how uh, drastically uh, the prices of energy can be influenced and, and at which speed they can be influenced. And, and hydrogen is a resource that is uh, all around us. Right? So by uh, deploying hydrogen as fast as we can and by achieving cost parity as fast as we can, I think we have not only an opportunity for us as supplier, but an opportunity for uh, all of us as a community. Mr. Fleckenstein, I, I was asking myself, uh, how it does it look like for us from the perspective of an OEM? I know in Japan, OEMs are treating their suppliers differently than, than in Europe uh, or, or United States. They're, they're rather working together. Here, it could happen to you if you only go on electricity and on BEFs, uh, that, that in a, uh, in a few, few years you won't have any suppliers left, or just very few, you know? That can't be in the interest of an OEM, or what would you say? Mm. I think you're absolutely right. I think the transition is, is a challenge for the OEMs, but also for the suppliers. And um, I think it is important um, that we are both going into these growing markets. Um, for example, what we said now about hydrogen. Hydrogen has uh, potential to be a big growing field. And I think at that point in stage, um, we, we, we are not concerned about who is taking which piece of the cake. Um, we, we now need to get started and, and we need to uh, um, get the system running first. And then um, our daily business um, with the discussions of the suppliers, and, and I think you know some suppliers like Bosch are quite strong and, and might uh, might even um, yeah have a stronger position in some fields than we do. Um, but uh, we, we will see how this will be in the future. Then <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Um, one interesting thing about the hydrogen and fuel cell technology, any very new technology at all, is that we don't need to build fresh new uh, fuel cell trucks, but we can retrofit uh, old trucks. And I know, uh, Mr. Dumoulin, that you're working together with a young startup called Eneo, a startup that removes the internal combustion engine from uh, uh, old diesel trucks and replaces it with an electric powertrain and uh, uh, supplies it with a battery and uh, with a fuel cell as a range extender. Um, this is not only the very practical way to decarbonize them quickly, it gives also uh, old diesel trucks a second life, something most people in this industry doesn't think about, circular economy, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, first of all, like I said, what is really driving us uh, in, this, uh, in this industry is making mobility zero emission. And if we only count on new trucks to do that, it will take time. There are literally um, tens of millions of trucks already on the road. If we can do something through uh, retrofit, 
to help those trucks already on the road uh, become cleaner, then we do something for the planet. And um, it's also a way to encourage the global infrastructure for hydrogen to develop even faster. The more demand we have from uh, uh, such users are, as uh, retrofitted trucks, uh, the faster the, the infrastructure will take off. So in the end, we, we see that, um, um, let's say, uh, uh, strategy as uh, primarily a way to make our goal, uh, um, to achieve our goal faster in terms of uh, making mobility zero emission, but also secondary as a way to, like you said, encourage circular economy and also encourage the development and infrastructure, a faster development and infrastructure. Is uh, retrofitting also a topic in China? It's not so much of a topic in China. There are many OEMs that are involved in building their fuel cell, product, uh, their fuel cell models of vehicles today already. Uh, so we, we do work with many OEMs uh, on their prototypes, and then the OEMs would take the prototypes to fleet production. Yeah. And Mr. Nowak, is circular economy a topic for Bosch, or uh, uh, is that uh, arrived at Bosch at, at all? No, definitely. The circular economy is a huge topic. That's not only for the vehicles. That's also if you look end of line scrap and, and, and end of life fuel cell stacks. So we, we definitely have our concepts how to do the recycling from the logistics perspective, but also from the process of recycling. That's definitely something. I think that we are talking now about refitting of existing trucks it might also be a consequence of the late start of some truck manufacturers in going into hydrogen, right? So now we have our product ready at Bosch for zero's production. The technology was ready quite some time already. And that is why we went into those, those close discussions with companies like Nikola, newcomers in the scene, or also to upfitters. So less the refitter, more the upfitter. Companies that buy a chassis and build the powertrain and the fresh truck on top. They were more agile in the beginning, and that was for us quite an important partnership at that point of time. Now all the big OEMs are in. Now we are coming more to the standard established collaboration models. But in the beginning, refitter, upfitter, and also newcomers were very important to give it a success. I would like to open up this uh, discussion once again. If you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll be right with you. If you introduce yourself, it would be nice. My name is Renate Sattler, I'm from the company Green Solutions and uh, in our group we are your customers. We are a forwarding agent company and as your customer I'm deeply questioning the hydrogen heavy trucks uh, reality. Uh, when will it be there? How much will it cost us? Why should I retrofit? How much will the retrofitting? Where are my fueling stations? And mo finally, you already mentioned it. How can I be sure the 350 or 700 bars? So there are so many question marks that f the question for me is heavy duty trucks, yes, but uh, long, long, long away for a normal German forwarding agent company. Thank you very much for that question. Mr. Fleckenstein, that goes to you, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, I think so. <laughs> so um, first of all, I, I see as well as a challenge which what uh, the lady is, is describing. So we, we need to um, get into serious production uh, in the second half of this, this, this decade. So between 2025 and 30, somewhere our serious production will start. And up to that, there's a long way to go. We need to have the hydrogen refilling station. We need to have the hydrogen protocols, refilling protocols. Um, we, we need to have um, uh, the customers trained to, to work with these products. And um, that will be a, quite a challenge, which is not only to be done by the OEMs alone. We need our partner in politics. We need our partners in infrastructure. And uh, with those package, uh, we are currently working heavily to, to, to align and, and discuss uh, so the right approach, but still this is a big challenge. I think. Still not before the end of the 20s, right? She, she, she can, cannot uh, buy it before the end of 20s. In the second half of this in the, in the second half, okay. Ms. Ma, what about, couldn't she order a truck in China? Perhaps we can talk about it. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, yeah, so there's certainly an opportunity, and just like Ian said, it takes a lot of stakeholders to put their skin in in order for this to work. 
it's not easy. The ecosystem is large and wide. So it doesn't just take a fuel cell integrator nor a fuel cell system suppliers to make it work. We do need people to come in and make a true commitment to have a case in point. And I think Europe is ready for that case in point. So I would urge that everybody here in this room to think about what we could do together. And this is a great opportunity here for this week's discussion. Uh, Monsieur Dumoulin, um, Ineo is, is retrofitting these trucks. Do you know the price, what they take for a an, uh, uh, fuel cell truck? I couldn't tell. Well, these are my customers, so it would <laughs> okay. be for them to, <laughs> okay, to disclose you. that. So. <laughs> okay, you, you don't know a list of prices, so it's, it's, no, I it's don't still, have the, still undisclosed. I don't have the list of prices for the, for the okay. truck themselves, and it belongs, like I said, it belongs to our customers. Mm -hmm. But I definitely concur with the, the target of achieving uh, a price parity with uh, battery electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, we believe uh, we can achieve that by uh, before the end of this decade, actually. And we are even talking about 26, 27, which in automotive industry is almost, uh, almost tomorrow. So. Mr. Noak, you're quicker next year. We will see some Nikola trucks in Europe, don't we? Um, I mentioned the start of production at, at Bosch site of our fuel cell power module. And yeah. there are customers out there in the world, truck builders who will build trucks based on the fuel cell power module. Yes, there will be an offering, but I wouldn't raise the expectations too high because you heard about this ecosystem already. So if you, if you can go along with three or four refueling points, you might manage in partnerships to really load those hydrogen refueling stations so that they can be operated economic, economically. And as far as I know, in Germany, there are already 20 refueling uh, points for 350 bars, aren't she, they? She's talking about heavy-duty trucks and not about the community or the, the municipality trucks. So okay. the mm -hmm. refuse trucks and all these things, small, <coughs> medium-duty, 350 bar systems, refueling uh -huh. time doesn't matter because it's not free market. But if she wants to operate and refuel a heavy-duty truck in 10, 15 minutes, like you do today with diesel, you have technology right there, for example. There is one fuel station equipper. They can do it. They have the technology. But it's, it's difficult to get a business case. Mm -hmm. And there you need partners. Mr. Fleckenstein. Yeah. Yeah. And here I need to add something for my CEP hat. Um, yeah. That's exactly where the CEP is, is working on. So uh, that on the refilling station, so refilling station and the truck can communicate and the refilling station knows how much um, hydrogen needs to be pumped into the truck. And currently it's a limit on 700 bar technology up to 10 kilograms. But when we come there with a the truck, uh, we need 50 up to 80 kilograms. And that is currently not on a public station available. And that's why the CEP um, currently is, is, is so important um, to work on the standardization, codes and standards, SLH and... Or that. she has to build her own uh, refilling station. I have my doubts that she <laughs> is willing. Yeah, you do. You probably do. Yes, indeed. Would be a solution <laughs> as well. <laughs> why not? Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much once again for that question. Maybe there are other questions. I can see one over there. Still have time for another question. If you come closer, that would be a bit easier for me. Thank you. Oh, it's so crowded, isn't it? So, uh, Chris Jackson from a company called Proteum. We're a UK-based green hygiene company. Um, you're just talking about the business case. I wondered if any of the customers or indeed uh, any of the partners you're talking to also are talking about the fact that a hydrogen truck is not the same as an internal combustion engine truck. I mean, we don't have the same air quality issues. We don't have the same noise issues. How much are these factors being considered when you go and talk to partners? And if they're not being considered, why aren't they? I would like to answer this question. Yeah, I, I can start. So, so I think um, with our development targets, a hydrogen truck is as close as possible to, to a diesel conventional truck. We have the advantages, like, like you said, noise, uh, reduced noises, etc., which we know from uh, battery electric vehicles, which are combined. But um, still, it is a new type of vehicle, which has um, now uh, yeah, some uh, targets into development. For example, the durability. We, our target is to have the trucks running for 1 million, 1.2 uh, million kilometers. And, and these are the steps which now need to be done um, into the development process, um, and which takes some, some more years for, for having an equalized um, product, basically. Anybody else who would contribute to that? 
I think you know, what what also should be considered probably is the, is the real use case for the truck. So it's not only heavy duty is heavy duty is heavy duty. Long, not long haul is long haul is long haul. So that that Nikola can go into serious production quite soon with a well validated truck in the US also is a, is a, is a consequence of the profile. So if, if you have customers that travel in the Great Plains, so you tow the truck, you go on cruising speed, and then for the next hours, nothing changes. So very low loads, very low thermal load also on the fuel cell power drain. In the middle European, central European use case, if you cross the Alps daily, then I think there is much more requirement, a much more complicated requirement for the fuel cell power train in a heavy duty truck, towing really at, at highest load. And that's also the point where probably then we have to open up our mind from fuel cell also to combustion engine. So if we stay open in terms of technology, just focusing on bringing hydrogen to mobility application in heavy duty, we are much easier. Then we have more, more demand for hydrogen more demand for fueling stations, then the entire ecosystem can grow much faster. So will that be the solution, the hydrogen combustion engine in the, in the end? Uh, um, we don't need any fuel cells anymore in that. Oh, I, I wouldn't say that we don't need a fuel cell. We learned about the high efficiency that a fuel cell can provide. We learned about the noise reduction level that might be achieved with fuel cell trucks. So I don't think there is no need and no market for it. My, my statement is that if we want to build up a market quickly, then we should bring as, many, as much hydrogen to the market as possible, and then adding hydrogen mm. combustion engine at very low vehicle add-on cost right now compared to a fuel cell truck in parallel to the market would simply help all of us. I don't see a competition there. I see that it is really supplementing. Mm. Uh, Ms. Ma, in, in what about a, a light commercial vehicles? I know uh, the Scheffler's Highcraft is uh, developed together um, with Refire Group. Um, do you see a big market for light commercial vehicles or will they mainly be uh, battery electric vehicles? Uh, we see battery electric and fuel cell being complementary. But we do think as a channel or conduit for the fuel cell uh, application into the commercial vehicle space, heavy duty trucks is the killer appli application for the time being and to, for the first phase. Um, and it will get the uh, hydrogen infrastructure to, uh, to grow. And picking back on that, we can look at what other applications would make sense. For the time being, the battery electric like commercial vehicle is available and is taking, um, taking the, uh, the market in, in good terms. Um, we are now working to get the hydrogen, um, we, the fuel cell heavy duty trucks on the road for the time being. And the technologies and the product can be bridged over to light commercial vehicles when needed. There are companies that are developing that product already, so we do think that heavy-duty vehicles and then light-duty vehicles to follow. And Mr. Dumoulin, when we will have heavy-duty trucks on the road and we will have also refueling stations, somebody has to bring the hydrogen to the refueling station. You at Forestia have found in a very interesting a solution for that, not, not the trailer solution, but you, you will bring the hydrogen into containers. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's our, our belief and our conviction that we need to support the, the takeoff of the infrastructure as, as quickly and as cheaply as possible. And, and that's why we have um, developed uh, a mobile storage solution uh, for distribution purposes, which uh, should enable to drastically reduce the cost of distributing hydrogen to uh, this network of stations that will develop in Europe and in, in the world in the coming years. Very good. Thank you very much. We're running out of time, unfortunately. Thank you for your attention, for your good questions here. And thank you, uh, Ms. Ma and gentlemen here, being here on stage for this panel discussion. Please give them a big hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, next interview will be here at uh, just a minute time with Dennis Thomas, Global Business Development Leader at Accelera by Cummins about accelerating the shift to net zero. So stay tuned. The next interview will be very interesting as well. Thank you.